Awesome. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, thank you, Natalia. And I would like uh, to start by thanking the Office of Diversity and Inclusion for organizing uh, this uh, event. And I'd like to thank everyone for uh, making the time to attend it. In my presentation today, I will try to shed some light on the historical experience of uh, experiences of Arab Americans that produced their paradoxical status or paradoxical existence as both invisible and hypervisible in American society. And I will try to explain the factors that contributed to this uh, situation or existence. Identities are really hard to define in unambiguous and cohesive terms. Arab American is no exception in, uh, in this respect. In fact, one can argue that it's even harder to define what Arab American means for a number of historical circumstances uh, led to the construction of the two components of this identity, Arab and American as mutually exclusive and as opposing others. In addition, of course, Arab American, like any other identity is fluid in constant flux and thus it evades and resists essentialization. So maybe I should start by sharing with you what I mean by Arab Americans. By Arab Americans, I basically mean the communities formed by immigrants, immigrants from what are known today as Arab states who use different Arabic dialects as their everyday language before arriving in the United States. And the descendants of those immigrants who live in the United States today and identify as American. Now, this definition focuses on language and the cultural aspect of that identity because these identities are not homogenous in any way. Members of these communities subscribe to different religions, belong to different sects, denominations, come from different continents, hold different political views, belong to different economic and social classes. And in fact, many of them, of those, or at least some of them, strictly speaking, are not Arab if we understand Arab to mean people who descended from the Arab Peninsula. And that's why I focused on everyday using Arabic as their everyday language, because even some groups who don't, who haven't emerged from the Arab Peninsula, like for instance, some Amaziri communities in Northern Africa, they tended to use, and until today, use Arabic or a form of Arabic dialect as their everyday language. So here the emphasis is on language. It's this rich diversity that exists in Arab American communities that made it very hard to pigeonhole them in any of the categories in the classification system used by the Office of Management and Budget. It's the poverty of this classification system that's based on the fictitious notion of race, although later geographical and ethnic markers of identity have been added to it. It's the poverty of this system coupled with the tendency in American society to reduce complex identities to only one aspect or facet of these identities that are the leading factors for the invisibility 
of Arab Americans in the United States. Another factor is the racialization of Islam, especially after 9-11. This racialization of Islam placed religion at the center of every discussion that pertains to Arabs and Arab Americans in the United States. This had a very significant impact because it excluded a large part, if not the majority of the Arab Americans who happened to be Christians, not Muslims. The factors that contributed to the hyper visibility of Arab Americans in American society center around conflicts, primarily the Arab-Israeli conflict and American wars in the Arab world. A byproduct of these conflicts and war was the depiction and construction of Arabs, including Arab Americans, as a threat to so-called Western civilization and to the United States national security. The communities or the immigrants that are called Arab Americans arrived to, in the United States in different waves. Each wave had its distinctive features and arrived to the US at a particular historical juncture of American Arab relationships. These distinctive features and these historical and the historical circumstances in which each wave arrived affected <clears throat> the way this wave of immigrants was integrated or excluded in American society. The first wave arrived between 1880s and the 1920s. They were mainly from Syria greater Syria, historical Syria, which includes today's Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, and historical Palestine. There were mainly, the overwhelming majority of those immigrants were Christian. Before coming, you know, like, I don't know if you have read or heard about uh, James Baldwin's observation that no one was white before coming, before they came to the United States. This observation aptly describes the situation of this wave of immigrants. Before arriving to the United States, these groups had never identified as white had never heard about that category white. However, as a result of the racial policies in the United States, also because they arrived during one of the nativist moments, many nativist moments in American history, and that witnessed imposing a lot of restrictions, both on immigration and on naturalization. Many of these immigrants pursued the status of whiteness as a pathway to naturalization. It's important to keep in mind that at that time, there was a, a ban on the naturalization of Muslims in the United States. So the fact that many of these or the majority, overwhelming majority of members of this wave were Christians, it was easier for them to make a claim to whiteness, especially that many of them had fair complexion. And this is also a point that's very important to keep in mind, that Arabs have different complexions, not just different, uh, political views, but also different complexions, which is very important in the American context. So the fact that they, many of them had fair skin, were Christians, facilitated their 
attempt to make claim to whiteness in American courts. A number of, uh, they identified as Syrian immigrants, while the US officials considered them immigrants from what they call Turkey in Asia. So from the very beginning, it sh this shows that from the very beginning, American officials, immigration officials had difficulty in defining or putting a label on uh, immigrants from what we call today the Arab world. So a number of individuals from this group uh, sued the United States government for uh, in order to get uh, American citizenship. Uh, these, uh, and this was their pathway towards naturalization. These legal battles came to an end in 1915 in the case of Dow versus the United States when the judge in that case ruled that Syrian immigrants were uh, to be considered white. Now, this ruling opened the door for many members of that wave of immigrants to integration in American society because it bestowed on them what can be called honorary whiteness. So they became white, but not quite white. And therefore, while they managed to pursue economic opportunities in the US, they were not immune to attacks by the KKK, for instance, in Georgia. And there's also an infamous case of lynching that occurred to the Rumi family in uh, Lake City, Florida, where this couple was killed by uh, police, members of the police force in that city who shot uh, Nora Rumi in, at her store, then lynched her husband and shot him and left him to die on the street. So this was the first wave of immigrants and this attack, this lynching attack occurred in the early 1920s. Not all Arabs benefited from this honorary whiteness because some Arab territories were included in the 1917 Asian barred zone, which basically prevented people and individuals who lived in most of Asia from migrating to the United States. So this was the first wave of immigrants, of Arab immigrants. The second wave occurred between 1945 and 1967, arrived between 1945 and 1967. Once again, they were mainly from Syria, Lebanon, and Palestine. The majority was Christian, but there were two major differences between the individuals who arrived in the second wave and those who arri had arrived in the first one. In the second wave, with the second wave, we start to witness an increase in the number of Muslim immigrants. Because at that point, by that point, the ban on naturalization of Muslims had been lifted. Also, many members of this wave had developed an Arab nationalist consciousness as a result of the rise of Arab nationalism as a political ideology and a liberation movement in the Arab world. Yet despite these differences, like the members of the first wave of immigrants or the, the first and second wave of immigrants, Arab immigrants could be described as a model minority. The, the majority of them were Christian. They belonged to a middle class. Many of them had fair complexion and they didn't challenge existing racial 
structures and economic structures in the United States. However, this bubble in which Arab Americans lived was burst in 1967. It was the reaction of white America to the Arab defeat in 1967 that made Arab Americans for the first time, for the first time in a very long period, feel as racially inferior, unwanted and unwelcome strangers in the United States. Gloating at the Arab defeat in 1967 wasn't limited to American officials and American media. Ordinary Americans reveled in the humiliation of Arabs. A couple of weeks after the end of the war in June 1967, during the reunion of the 1957 class at Princeton University, attendee, attendees of that event mocked Arab prisoners of war who they had seen on TV screens by dressing like Arabs and walking around campus, raising their hands as a sign of surrender. It was in the context of the defeat, the Arab defeat in 1967 and white America's reaction to uh, that defeat that the first American national, first national Arab American organization was formed, which was the Association of Arab American University Graduates, which was established in 19, December 1967 and came to an end in 2007. This is a quote from their definition of themselves, how they saw themselves. It was, it's a non-sectarian organization that was dedicated to fostering better understanding between the Arab and American peoples while promoting informed discussion of critical issues concerning the Arab world. The two main critical issues that they focused on, that this organization focused on was the Arab-Israeli conflict and America's policies in the Arab world. Another national Arab organization that was formed was the, Arab, the American Arab Anti-Discrimination Committee. And notice here the difference in the order and way this order. Here it's Arab American, here American Arab. And the difference in the order reflects not just the ambiguity of the identity, but also the different focus of each group, of each organization. The American Arab Anti-Discrimination Committee was formed in 1980 by former U.S. Senator James Aburiz, and it still exists, and it's the largest uh, national Arab uh, American organization that exists until today, and it defines itself as a civil organization committed to defending the rights of people of Arab descent and promoting their rich cultural heritage. Once again, this is from their websites, the way they define themselves. These organizations were formed by the children of the first wave of immigrants, their grandchildren, members of the second wave of immigrants, and also members of the third wave that arrived between 1967 and 1990. In the third wave, we start to see a change in the composition. We start to see an increase in the number of immigrants that arrived from Iraq and Yemen. They had arrived before, they were immigrants from Iraq and Yemen who had arrived before, but now we saw an increase in them and also from Libya and Egypt, also from Palestine, especially after the war 
after the 1967 war and also from Lebanon after the outbreak of the civil war there. And then there were also more Muslims in that, in that wave than previous waves. And many of those members of that wave were still influenced by Arab nationalists. The influence of Arab nationalism as an ideology and movement really fades away in the fourth wave, whose members came mainly from Iraq, Somalia, Egypt, Yemen, Algeria, Morocco, and Tunisia. Notice here for the first time that we see large numbers coming from North Africa. The majority of this wave was Muslim. And many of them identified as Muslims first and Arab second as a result of a number of factors that occurred both in the Arab wo world, primarily the rise of political Islam as an ideology and movement and the decline in the influence of uh, uh, Arab nationalism. And also as a result of the suppression of Arab American activism in the United States, a topic that I'll talk about in a minute, while allowing Islamic groups and political Islamist groups to operate openly and freely in the United States, especially during the 80s, which was really a honeymoon between the um, American state, the US state and political Islam as a result of their cooperation in Afghanistan against the Soviet Union. So many of those immigrants who came in the eighties felt that it was, they wanted to stay out of trouble. So they were not really uh, very enthusiastic about, or many of them about getting involved in politics. They wanted to stay out of trouble. Uh, many mosques were established in the United States during the 80s. So this was one of the first, uh, mosques were some of the first places that new immigrants would uh, go to, to establish networks in the United States and to, uh, you know, meet other people from the same background. So these are some of the factors that contributed to many of these members of this uh, wave identify first as Muslims and secondly as Arab. But it's important to keep in mind that these two identities overlap and they're not necessarily mutually exclusive, unlike the way political Islamists, which is an ideology, not a religion, it's a political ideology and movement, not a faith or a religion, try to construct these two identities. As I mentioned, these two organizations were the first two national Arab American organizations that were established. Before that, there was an organization called Organization of Arab Students, but it wasn't uh, so much Arab American. It uh, consisted mainly of uh, its members, mainly were Arab students who were studying in the United States. The activities of the two organizations focused on creating awareness and articulating Arab American positions on the Arab Israeli conflict and on the discrimination against Arabs in the United States. They would organize talks, uh, publish uh, ads in newspapers, uh, all that, but this and other type of activities, nothing really uh, confrontational. Yet these activities were not welcome, neither by the American state 
nor by uh, groups in American civil society who tried to suppress this activism. In the 1970s, the Nixon administration developed the Hudson plan to surveil, to place a number of groups, including Arab Americans under surveillance. The Hudson plan was short-lived, but it was soon followed by the establishment or by the creation of Operation Boulder in 1972, which targeted both Arab students in the United States, non-Arab citizen, Arab citizens in the United States who were around 80,000 at that time, and also Arab American citizens. In the 80s, during the Reagan administration, the INS made a contingency plan to detain Arabs and Iranians in Louisiana, in detention facilities in Louisiana. Also in the mid eighties, the case of the LA-8 started. The LA-8 are seven Arab Americans and a woman of Kenyan origin, who American, whom, whom the uh, security agencies in the US accused of being members and of a Palestinian group called the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, and detained them and tried to deport them. Their case lasted for 20 years and was finally settled in 2007. In the 1990s, there were calls by an American senator during the, uh, the first American Gulf War to activate the INS plan that was made in the 80s. And a number of Arabs were deported from the US based on secret evidence. There's a law called the law that's about secret evidence, which means that the lawyers of the suspects or the accused cannot even have access to the evidence that the state is using against them. And as a result of uh, this uh, practice, a number of Arab, Arabs were deported from the United States in the 90s. Notice that all this happened before 9-11. All what I'm mentioning here is before 9-11. And I'm just focusing on the major events and operations. There are other minor things that were happening. Notice that this happens, happened before 9-11, before any Arab or Muslim group had carried out any attacks on American in the United States. And the existence of these plans and these operations, in my opinion, that's an opinion, I don't have information, in my opinion, explains the speed with which Arab and Muslim and non-Arab uh, Muslims were rounded and detained after 9-11. In my opinion, I, I will not be surprised if what happened after 9-11 was basically the activation of plans that had already been in place since at least the 80s. The suppression of Arab activism wasn't limited to the state. Arab American activists and organizations faced a siege in American civil society. For instance, in 1978, James Zogby, an Arab American leader, was disinvited from an ethnic leaders meeting at the White House after some groups uh, opposed or protested his invitation because they believed or they argued that he was a pro-Palestinian Arab American. Arab American organizations were also excluded from the coalition 
for a new foreign and military policy, a coalition that consists of a number of uh, non-governmental organizations and uh, civil society actors, because a number of groups had threatened to withdraw from it if Arab Americans were allowed to join. There were also threats to withdraw from the 20th anniversary, anniversary of Martin Luther King's March on Washington. And had it not been for the intervention of Jesse Jackson, Arab Americans would have not been allowed to participate in that uh, on that occasion. A more recent example is the unhiring of Stephen Salaita, which happened in uh, 2014. Stephen Salaita is an Arab academic who was uh, given a tenured position at the University of Illinois at Urbane-Champaign. Urbane -Champaign. He was offered the position, but before in July, July, August, before the semester started, the new academic year started, Israel launched an attack on uh, Palestinians in Gaza. Stephen Salaita posted or tweeted some comments on Twitter, tweeted some comments which were used, which led to a campaign to pressure the university to withdraw its offer. And we know now because the chancellor uh, or one of the leading senior administrators of the university, I think it was the chancellor of that university, uh, was forced to share during the trial emails that she had received from different organizations in the United States and from different rich donors who had threatened to withdraw their donations if Stephen Salaita had been, was allowed to uh, start his uh, appointment, his tenured appointment at that university. Now, the efforts of one particular Zionist organization in the United States, the Jewish Defense League, had more tragical consequences. There was, and was more violent. There was a bomb attack on the PLO office in New York, a bomb attack on the Lebanese consulate in Los Angeles, bomb attacks on offices of the ADC, the uh, American Arab Anti-Discrimination Committee and other Arab American organizations, the murder of Iskandar. I used his uh, Arabic name, Although if any one of you would like to learn more about him, it would be easier to Google him under his uh, American or Anglicized name, Alex Roda. But I used his name, Iskandar Roda, because that's the name that he used when uh, on his uh, publications in Arabic. So basically, uh, Iskandar Roda or Alex Roda was the regional director of the ADC in uh, Southern California, a university professor who was killed in a bomb attack on the ADC's office in Santa Ana in California on October 11th, 1985. Iskandar Oda was a nonviolent activist who was for dialogue between Arabs and Jewish American communities. In fact, on the day he was murdered, he was scheduled to give a talk at a synagogue. Two years after his murder, the city of Santa Ana uh, made a statue for him that was defaced twice. And there were also other violent attacks. And Iskandar Oda, as I mentioned, he was a professor and a father of three young daughters. There were also other violent attacks on Arab American activists, 
for example, Muhammad Mahdi, an Arab American activist of Iraqi origin and the director of uh, the Action Committee on Arab American Relations was brutally attacked. And he ended up, I don't know, he had a number of ribs broken and was hospitalized and he wasn't the only one. There were many other uh, cases. Now, as far as I know, not a single person was arrested or ended up spending time in prison as a result of any of these attacks. In fact, the two main, but the main groups that was suspected of being out of being behind all these attacks is a group called Jewish Defense League. The two main suspects in the murder of Skandar Oda live today in two settlements, Israeli settlements in the West Bank. So they were allowed to leave the US. They were not, as far as I understand, imprisoned. What might explain that is the fact that state agencies cooperated with non-state actors in suppressing Arab American activism in the 70s and the 80s. We know for sure, because the FBI acknowledged that not only did it spy on an Arab American activist named, uh, his name is Abdin Jabbara, even before 1967, but it also admitted sharing information about him with what, and I'm using the terms that were used by sharing information with Israeli, Jewish, and Zionist organizations. It also admitted sharing information about him with three foreign states, including Israel, the same activist, Abdin Jabbara, who had served as a president of the Arab American uh, uh, University Graduate Association in 1972, and later was also president of the ADC. He was also placed under surveillance by the NSA and the CIA. So there are incidents of cooperation between state representatives and non-state actors in repressing Arab American activism. The 70s and the 80s were the heyday of Arab American activism that was carried out by non-sectarian and pan-Arabist uh, organizations. The activities of these groups were eclipsed or have been eclipsed since the 90s by the activities of organizations that are based on religious basis, that are based on religious identities, namely Islam. But there's still in the US, especially in the Bay Area and Michigan, a number of uh, pan-Arab, non-sectarian Arab groups. Today, Arab Americans have been in the United States for almost 140 years. By now, they have been in the United States for almost 140 years, which is a long period, which is long enough to invent a historical tradition, especially in a state that has been around only for, or a state that has existed for only 240 years, a little bit over 240 years. 
the majority of Arab Americans today have been born and raised in the United States and are immersed in American culture. They are at home, unlike their parents, they are at home at the United States. And in contrast to their parents and earlier generations, they don't have any dreams or plans for returning to the Arab world, which makes ending this paradoxical existence of Arab American, Americans in American society and makes ending it a necessity for this generation, which lives primarily in urban centers in California, New York, and Michigan. And they have at their disposal skills and resources that earlier generations of Arab Americans lacked. For instance, they of course their skills, language skills, knowledge about American culture and American society, and also a number of universities in the United States today. There are programs for Arab American studies. There's also an association of Arab American studies in the United States today. And by, I think it was in 2017, in 2017, Arabic became the second most taught foreign language at high schools in the United States. These resources like Arab American study programs have the potential of filling the gap that was created by the decline in the activities and influence of Arab American universities. They can create spaces for the younger generations of Arab Americans to articulate new expressions of Arab American identity that's not plagued by the sectarianism that a number of institutions have spread in the Arab American community in the last couple of decades. We are meeting here today because less than two years ago, American Congress designated April as the American Arab American Heritage Month. The next step for ending the invisibility of Arab Americans is to create a category of Arab Americans in the next census. In order to achieve this goal, Arab Americans need to resist attempts made to imprison them in religious and sectarian enclaves. They also need to reject opportunistic calls that would like them to focus on restoring their, the honorary whiteness that earlier generations of Arab Americans enjoyed. They also need to build alliances and work with other minority groups that aim at building a more inclusive and diverse America. Is this a difficult challenge and task? You bet it is. Will it take time? Yes. Is it doable? Yes. Is it necessary? Definitely. Once again, I'd like to thank Natalia and the Office of Diversity and Inclusion for organizing this event and thank you all for attending. And now it's to you, to you Natalia. Natalia.
Thank you so much, Dr. Hassan. Um, I had a quite, I have a few questions myself, but I want to open it up to um, our students. Um, but before we do that, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, I'm an associate professor at uh, the political science department. I arrived first to the United States uh, as a graduate student. I went to grad school at uh, DU, have a master's and PhD in international studies. After uh, finishing my uh, uh, graduate studies, I went back to Egypt where I taught at Egypt. Uh, and I I've joined uh, CU Denver, I believe around 2013, 2013, 2014. And I've been with the political science department since then. Uh, I also have uh, a certificate in human rights and a BA in mass communication. Awesome, that is amazing. Um, does any of our students have any questions for Dr. Hassan? I have one question um, for Dr. Bassem. Where do you see the, you know, um, the Arab, uh, American um, community um, in the future of politics in the U.S. right now in, com in terms of like participating their strength and weaknesses. What do you see their future um, in American politics in general? Frankly, I'm optimistic about the future of Arab Americans for a number of reasons. First of all, there is there are many positive changes taking place in the US today. There is an increasing awareness that the racial or racialized system that exists or that has existed in the US since its creation is uh, how to put it is <laughs> just racial is, is racist is racist it's not anymore racial it's racist and they are there is a growing opposition to this system so that's something positive now will it on its own, will it just like, just because there's criticism and critique and increasing awareness, will it end on its own? No, it will take a lot of work to do that. I'm optimistic also because America's war, wars in the Arab world are coming to an end. Maybe not as fast as many would like them to end, but I don't think that America's war in the Arab world would last for another three decades. Also the critique of Israeli policies today in the United States is not just limited to Arab Americans or to leftist groups. And it will become more mainstream over time which means that two of the main factors that contributed to the construction of, or at least I hope or expect that the influence of these two factors that contributed to the construction of Arab American as a threat to the United States national security, that their influence will decline. Also, as I mentioned, the newer generations of Arab Americans have skills and resources that were not available to their parents or that their 
earlier generations didn't have. All this makes me really optimistic. And it's just like, actually like there's so many Arab Americans who are really active in American society, but whose Arab background is quite invisible for a number of reasons, you know, many of them show that for security, for safety. But I think with the decline in the influence of the Arab-Israeli conflict and America's wars in the, in the Arab world, that many of these individuals would uh, quote unquote, uh, okay, would, would actually express and show their Arab heritage. And I'm confident that the existence of Arab American studies programs in a number of American universities will instill, over time, will instill pride in the young American generations, about Arab American generations, and will make them keen on learning more about the experiences of these earlier generations and of understanding the history of Arab American activists and the sacrifices that they made. Will it be easy? No, definitely not. One requirement for accomplishing this transformation, in my opinion, is to heal the wounds and close the divisions that political Islam created in the Arab American community, whose who large parts of it, if not even the majority of it until today, is mainly Christian, is a majority, a Christian majority. Of course, it's really hard to tell because there are no uh, definite numbers, but if they're not a majority, then at least a large part of that community is Christian, which is totally alienated and excluded by political Islam as a movement and ideology, not Islam as a faith. But I'm, I'm optimistic. Does this answer your question, Ismi? Yeah, it does. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Notice that even in Hollywood's depiction of uh, Arabs, you can see some change. Still, the majority of the representation of Arab in Hollywood movies is very negative. In Hollywood, is very negative. And even the so called positive depiction or positive change, it's a liberal depiction that's not critical of the structures and conditions in which that have suppressed Arab Americans. But I, I believe there is reason to be optimistic. There's reason to be optimistic. Is there another question for Dr. Hassan? I had a question. Asking, yes, I did. What role do you think uh, Arab Americans today have in uh, like working to fight for the Palestinian cause? It's uh, the same role that they have been playing since the late 60s, which is educating the American, wider American public about that conflict, 
about the plight of the Palestinians, about their dispossession, building alliances with groups that support similar struggles in the United States and outside the United States, especially indigenous groups or, or groups that support indigenous struggle. I know that uh, many Arab Americans are active in uh, the BDS campaign, which is boycott, divestment, and sanctioning for Israel. Uh, but it's also important to keep in mind that, as I mentioned earlier, that many, uh, that Arab Americans hold different views. Not all Arab Americans have the same views or the same interests in the Arab, uh, in, the, in the Palestine question. It's important to keep this in mind. Also, I think the best, the best thing that Arab Americans can do to support the Palestine, the cause of the Palestinians is to offer a model of non-sectarian politics and activism. Because the Palestinian cause has been seriously damaged by the sectarianist strategies employed by many actors, both in the Arab world and outside the Arab world, that led to many internal conflicts in a number of Arab states. So presenting this example, an example of non-sectarian activism and existence is in my opinion, at least for now, the best thing that uh, Arab Americans can do to promote the cause of Palestine. Thank you, Basim. You're welcome. You're welcome. Azir? I did have a question. How do you um, see Arab American students being supported on the CU Denver campus and how can we better that um, become more um, inclusive to their multiple layers of intersectionality um, and provide resources um, to help with advancement? Personally, frankly, I think they're not supported at all. One of the reasons for that is their invisibility. Another reason is the way they're struggling with their identity. And I have to add here and thank you, Natalia, for referring to intersectionalities. This is also a reason for optimism because in university spaces and in programs of Arab American studies, I believe younger generations of Arab Americans will be given a chance and a space to articulate their identities that forms of identities that will emphasize intersectionality and they will not feel that they need to choose between their cultural identity or ethnic identity, if you want to call it, and their religion. This is something that's very, I believe is optimistic. What can the university do? I believe like what happened today is a good start. I think uh, organizing more events about um, Arab Americans, reaching out to Arab American students, try to identify them, uh, makes them feel welcome, makes them feel that they have a space where they can go and share their concerns. You know, maybe at one point, at one point, an office for Arab American students can be 
established as well. All this can help, but I think it's not just about what the university can do. It's mainly about, in my opinion, it's also about what Arab students on campus do to make themselves visible. I know at the moment I'm, uh, I'm currently advising a student organization, it's called uh, Arab Cultural Community, which uh, uh, is planning to organize at the end of this month an event on uh, 10 years after the Arab Spring where st Arab students will share their experiences during the so-called Arab Spring. So I will, and I will share with you information about that. So maybe publicizing events organized by Arab American students. I think all these will be, even if they're just small steps, but there will be important steps to make Arab students visible on this campus. It's also important to keep in mind that not all Arab students on this campus are Arab Americans. They're also international students who are Arabs who face the other challenges because every time there is a wave of anti-Arab attacks in the US, they experience it in a very different way than Arab American st uh, students because Arab American students, at least they have their families here and they have networks of support but it's international students from Arab majority states who are often totally on their own. And it's important that the university reaches out to these groups, try to create spaces for them to uh, express themselves and their concerns. I was in the US, I was a student in the US when 9-11 happened. As I mentioned, I was at DU. One of the first thing that, and the university helped us, but that a group of Arab students did was to organize a meeting with, that was open to everyone on campus to actually talk about what happened in 9-11. So talking about things and not hiding, not pushing things under the rug is the first step. I remember also that Chancellor Ritchie, who was the chancellor at uh, DU at that point, in the first, I think it was the first Ramadan after the 9-11 attacks, he organized a day, for an Arab uh, Islamic cultural day on campus where he invited all these Arab restaurants to serve different types of Arab food. And it was, you know, like a very positive way to show a diff to show that Arabs are just people like everyone else. And you know, also organizing such events, I think would be also something good that's, uh, that you can uh, do. I think this, these were, after organizing these two events after 9-11 at DU, the tension on the DU campus really declined. I remember before organizing these events, I heard American students talking about like uh, bombing Mecca, the Kaaba, which is uh, the Kaaba is uh, the mosque that Muslims respect the most. This was before organizing these events. After organizing these events, I didn't hear any such calls on that campus. It doesn't mean that everyone had changed their opinion, but at least many didn't feel comfortable enough to express them openly anymore. Thanks for that. Um, and please do get the information to us. Um, we can support with advertising and also attending if, if uh, we're welcome or um, any other type of support that we can give. Do we have a department? 
for uh, Arab studies? No, no, no. In the future, it will happen. That's for sure. <laughs> if we keep having these kind of conversations. I hope so. Yeah, hopefully. Really and I'd like to thank Luis Hernandez for posting the link to uh, Real Bad Arabs. Uh, but it's uh, it's it's R double E because it's real from the from film Real Bad Arabs, which is a very good documentary. Uh, a more recent documentary that deals with the same topic, which is a representation of Arabs in uh, Hollywood, is uh, called uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, Valentino's Ghost. Valentino's Ghost is uh, a more recent documentary that deals with the same topic. And if uh, anyone is interested in like uh, a short video about the case of the Rumi family that was lynched in, that was murdered and the husband was lynched in uh, Florida around 1921, please let me know and I can uh, share a link. My email, for those of you who don't have it, is basim.hassan at ucdenver.edu. So if you need any resources on Arab culture, on Arab politics, on Arab Americans, please feel free to email me. Thank you, Natalia, for sharing. Please feel free to email me and I will share with you the little bits that I know. And I will definitely get the information out to um, those of you that attended. Um, yeah, this has been amazing. Does anyone have any last questions? Yeah, I know we only have about five minutes left, but I'm really curious and interested to see how, how did you organize that 9-11 event? And I ask that just sort of like mentally trying to configure how we would do that like on our own campus. Because my only worry would be um, the safety of the Arab community. I feel like mm -hmm. people would probably be really hostile, um, at least internally. And, and then something about that discomfort and racial stereotypes. So I'm, I'm real curious, how did you organize that 9-11 it just, it was just organized. A hall was reserved, advertised. Because like, see, regardless of whether such events are organized or not, Arabs will face hostility, regardless. So it's better to be proactive and face these possibilities in a collective way rather than suffering individually and being attacked as individuals. Was it an emotional meeting? Yes. Was it tense? Yes. Was it a little bit hostile? Yes. But also keep in mind that most of the people who would attend these meetings or at least many of them would also be willing to listen and that they're there to learn. So it's, it's a risk worth taking, in my opinion. It's something that any marginalized and suppressed group or community, it's a reality that they have to face. Otherwise, the invisibility of members of these groups, in our case, that we're talking about today, Arab Americans, will be perpetuated and prolonged. So everything is dangerous. Not Fortunately, being active is dangerous. Being active is dangerous. And it's, people's, it's up to people to choose what they would like to do. But really, like, it wasn't like any, uh, didn't take anything special. It was just coordination with the, uh, with the university's administration, uh, reserving a meeting hall and advertising it and going there and uh, 
Yeah, and just talking and being patient. And that's that's all, Swan. Thank you, boss. You're welcome, sir. Thank you, Professor. You're welcome, Brad. Thank you all. Thank you all for your interest. We have someone raising their hand. Yes, please. Yeah, I can stay as long as you want. Yeah, uh, uh, I'm sorry, doctor, but it is just a quick uh, notice that uh, even the last week of one of the Arab, we didn't see any. Uh, most of the people are kept silent, especially the Arab. We didn't see, and even the American, I, I don't see any action that is took to um, to break the ice and people kept silent. And I think you have some hate <laughs> or they are being afraid of talking with Arab because of the um, recent shooting in Boulder. In Boulder, I can, okay, I can refer to one uh, thing that was organized by, uh, I happen to be a member of the BIPOC Student Resource Committee at the Political Science Department. We organized, the committee organized a meeting with uh, students, BIPOC students in the Political Science Committee to uh, talk about not just that event, but also the shooting in Atlanta. For some logistical reasons that were not up to the committee, this uh, event wasn't, or that meeting wasn't widely publicized. But uh, the committee, the BIPOC Student Resource Committee at the Political Science Department is planning to organize more meetings to talk about not just this issue, but many things that concern racial relations in the political science department. We are planning to have at least two meetings every semester, one at the beginning of the semester and one close to the end. And in fact, we're having, I think we're having one uh, this month and I will make sure to share the information with you, Ali, if we end up having it. Hey, thank you so much. You're welcome. Any other questions? Let's give a round of applause. That was an excellent. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you to everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, doctor. Thank, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice day. You too. And I will send you this link to that video about the lynching if you want to yeah. share it. If you could send all of the, the material and information that we talked about today, that would be great. Um, even, uh, your slides. Okay. This was very good. Thank you very much for organizing it, Natalia. Oh, no problem. I, I am deeply wanting to get cultural involvement on CU's campus and those invisible identities need to become visible. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to meeting you in person when we open, uh, when the campus reopens, and then we can exchange more ideas and talk about how to at least, you know, not, you know, like what we can do with Arab, uh, the, in regard to Arab American students, but also if there's anything I can do, uh, you know, that relates to BIPOC students on campus, please don't hesitate to reach out. Definitely. I have some, um, some events that I'm planning for next semester and hopefully um, either offer them in hybrid or, or actually in person. So I definitely will reach out to you. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Have okay. a wonderful day. You too. You too. Bye. CII staff, um, we're going to go ahead and end for the day. Uh, you have any questions?